The Oxford Sparks Podcast, Episode 7, Artificial Intelligence, Part 3. Artificial speech recognition devices uh, are notoriously bad at uh, recognising words compared to, say, for example, human adults. We're able to be extremely flexible in the way that we recognise words, produced by different speakers in different contexts. Try playing around with your sat-nav using your voice recognition device. I am sorry, I did not get that. And you'll discover quickly how primitive our, our voice recognition tools are from an artificial point of view. Recalculating route. Hello, my name is Kim Plunkett and I'm Professor of Cognitive Science at the Department of Experimental Psychology at the University of Oxford. I'm interested in how babies' brain development influences their, their mental development. Uh, so, uh, as their brain develops during the first couple of years of life, uh, how does that influence their ability, for example, to engage in cognition and learn a language, in particular their, their mother tongue. Professor Plunkett works in a unique unit called the Baby Lab. In the Baby Lab, we're particularly interested in how babies learn about words. So, for example, how do they know when a word is identical across different speaker variations? So if uh, I use the word dog, uh, I'm using it in a southern British English accent, but if I were a Scottish speaker or a Welsh speaker, I would pronounce the word in, in, in a rather different way. Another type of issue that we're interested in in the baby lab at Oxford is how uh, infants learn the meanings of words. So not just to recognise the word forms themselves, but to actually use these words to communicate in a meaningful way. So, for example, when you're learning the meaning of the word dog, hopefully, eventually, you'll use this word to talk about the same kind of animals that other speakers of your language will, will use the word for. This may seem a, a trivial problem at, at first glance, but in fact, when you start thinking about the learning situation, it becomes quite complicated. If it's complicated for us, and we seem pretty good at it, what hope is there for machines to master language? It's one thing to write a program to get the computer to perform a task, knowing exactly what it's got to do. Another thing is to get a, a machine to write its own program to perform the task, which effectively is what infants are doing when they're learning about language and learning about the world in general. Now we have the computing power and, and the data to, to analyse. We're seeing how big data in terms of infants uh, learning about the world who are constantly bombarded with information could be used to extract um, extract useful structures for guiding behavior and building men mental representations in the brain. One might hope that in addition to being able to come up with theories about how infants learn to recognize words, one might come up with ideas about how to improve on our speech recognition systems. And roboticists often um, uh, ask me this question. They want to know how, uh, how infants develop um, because this could inform their understanding or their, their ideas about how to develop robots, um, in particular how to get robots to learn. So the more the claim being that if we understand how humans develop we're going to be in a better position to uh, incorporate those, those facts into uh, building intelligent machines. And it works both ways. Just as understanding how we learn language might help us improve language recognition by machines, artificial intelligence is being used as a tool to help us understand how we learn language. Well, artificial intelligence can play several roles in, in, in this research. 
One um, as a proof of concept and one as a way of coming up with, with, with new ideas. So how is artificial intelligence actually used? We use uh, what are called neural network models of the brain to help us model the process of uh, category formation, word learning and acquisition of grammar. A model is just a simplified way of representing what we think something is like, whether it's a process like language acquisition or of objects and structures like cardboard models of houses or the structure of the brain itself. Neural network models are collections of very simple processing units uh, connected to each other, much like neurons are connected by uh, synapses in the brain. And the idea is that we present stimuli to these uh, neural network models, much in the same way as light falls on the retinal cells in the eye, or in, in, in indeed acoustic patterns are picked up by the ear, and then the sensors translate these into electrical signals that then stimulate activity in the brain. Neural networks come in different varieties and can be used to study different ideas of how things work. They may be uh, layered models where the neurons are, are organised in a, in, a, in a plane and um, activity propagates through different levels, different planes or maps in order to mimic the way that the visual system is working or the auditory system is working. And we can use these models to mimic aspects of what baby is doing in the lab. So for example, we can build neural network models um, of word recognition, in which the model is given the task simply of recognizing a word, the same, same word that baby is asked to recognize in an experiment, say. And by looking at the way that the model can learn to recognize the word, we can compare that with the way that the baby seems to recognize the word. Where baby makes mistakes, does the, does the model make mistakes? Does the model do things that we hadn't predicted? Does the model enable us to come up with new ideas about what baby actually might be doing when she's representing the form of a word in the brain. And just as a meteorologist might need to use a computer model to handle all of the complex information required to predict the weather... Even more so, possibly, with, with uh, trying to predict uh, all of the factors that can contribute to human behaviour and the way that the brain drives that behaviour. So how do infants connect sounds with the meanings we associate with them? Imagine a child hearing a word associated with an object, the word dog, associated word with the word dog. How do they come to know that that sound, dog, is nothing more than just a property of the object dog? Just like the dog has four legs, it's furry, etc. They hear this sound at the same time as they see the object. It's just another property that the brain's picking up. How do they learn that the sound has a special property? The word dog actually refers to is, or is a name for that object out there. Imagine going to a far off land. You see a furry animal with long ears hopping around and you point and ask what it is. A local says, Gavagai. Does Gavagai mean rabbit, animal, something that hops around at noon? Or why are you pointing at that? With so many possible meanings, how do we make the right connection? The infant is just picking this up by, by experiencing uh, the world, interact social interactions with, with their caregivers and other children, other adults. This is taking place over, over time and one of the things that experimental psychologists have been interested in is how memories for events become consolidated and integrated over time. 
When you hear a word associated with an object even just once, it may create a memory for that association. It may not be a very strong memory. The more times you hear it, perhaps the stronger the memory is. But recent research with adults suggests that sleep plays a very interesting role in sorting out these memories. One finding has been that if you teach adults new words, then let them sleep as opposed to just stay awake, uh, they're much better at generalizing those new words to other members of the category of objects that it was a, the word was initially associated with than those who've just stayed awake. So does the same thing happen with babies? Babies, of course, sleep a lot more than adults. This is an opportunity for them to consolidate and integrate their learning experiences. And the nice thing about babies, of course, is that we can bring them into the lab and they might nap just for a couple of hours. So before they go to sleep, we can teach them some stuff and they can go to sleep or not go to sleep, depending on their uh, sleep-wake patterns, and then test them after they've had a nap or after they've gone for a walk in the park in their stroller with mum uh, and see whether their, their learning has changed depending on whether they had a sleep or didn't have a sleep. So there are a variety of different things that we can do in the lab to try and figure out how memories are laid down over time and how the sleep rhythms, in this case, influence these, these memories. Through making a lot of observations in a lab, where you have more control and awareness of all the various differences, you're more likely to pick up on the differences that may have contributed to the results that you get in experiments such as this. We need to know what the stimuli were that the infant heard or saw, uh, what the timing of those events were, um, what mother was doing during the course of these events to see whether to what extent there is support from the mother or can the baby do this all by herself as well. Beyond understanding how things normally work, approaches using artificial intelligence may also help us better understand how things can go wrong. It's not uncommon uh, these days when building models of um, uh, infant behaviour to break the models and use the, the broken models to see whether they capture aspects of uh, deviant or abnormal development. In breaking the models in particular ways, we're perhaps in a position to understand what might be broken in the infant where abnormal behaviour is observed. So how do we build a machine that can truly understand the meaning behind words? A sat-nav can pick up on words like shop or school and it can find them on a map for you. But it doesn't know what these things are. It can't tell you what a shop is for or why you might want to go to a school. A machine that could learn what words actually mean, rather than just making associations, might be able to learn language in the way that we do. If we could solve that problem, I think we're going to make important steps forward in understanding the basis of human cognition. You've been listening to the Oxford Sparks podcast, narrated by me, Lou Sumner, and produced by the University of Oxford. For more fascinating science, follow us on Twitter and Facebook and head to OxfordSparks.com.